at the booking group, Stephen got sick, texted me this morning and said, I'm in bed sick, but I'll come if you make me. <laughs> okay. So I said, okay, who could I call to help me in an emergency? So Kendra, is, I mean, excuse me, Kara is here with us, so please give her a special round of applause. Thank you, and, thank you, Colleen. And in addition to that, Kara and I were both co-chairs of the Broadway League 25th Anniversary National Conference, and so I know she can do anything in a pinch from hanging out with Neil Patrick Harris <laughs> to making sure the trains run on time. <laughs> okay. So one of, the, one of the reasons we have the title we have is Paul Lippmann, who had been the chair of the Broadway League, and all three of us are members of the Broadway League, and it is similar to the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. It is our trade show, our trade association, and our service association. And Paul was our chair, and in one of his speeches he said, you know, Broadway isn't just from 41st Street to 55th and then down to the Lincoln Center. It's actually the longest road in America because there are hundreds of theaters across the country who present Broadway. Now, one of the things that we were asked by arts presenters to do this session is to talk about the notion of Broadway. First of all, how many people in this room present Broadway? Okay, so this is a, like, it's a good turnout. One of the things we wanted to talk about is people either tend to think of Broadway as commercial and commerce, or that it is not accessible in terms of our missions and our goals. And it's one of the things that we find uh, that all three of us spend a great deal of time in terms of presenting and working with presenters. I'm going to ask that Kara begin and really talk about the booking of Broadway, what that relationship is to presenters, and how it actually functions. Kara? Thanks, Colleen. Um, well, I work for the Booking Group. We are a theatrical booking agency, and we represent tours all across North America. I've been at the agency since 1999, um, and we book uh, musicals as well as straight plays when the market permits us to. Uh, we negotiate on behalf of the Broadway producers with presenters on the road. One of the things that we do when we start out with any kind of show is um, either we already have a relationship with the producer on the show and therefore we, uh, we get to book it, which is really great. Um, and we start those conversations sometimes early, even before the show may open on Broadway if we have that kind of relationship with the producer. Or sometimes um, a producer will ask for a bunch of agencies to go in and pitch for a show and we go in and pitch for the show and tell them about our agency and the services that we provide and see if that kind of relationship is the one that they're looking for and then a producer will hire us to represent their show on the road. Um, after we've established that relationship we begin working with the producer and the general manager of the show on setting a price for the show overall that we can then bring to presenters um, and start talking talking to our buyers in North America. Uh, the price is determined by a lot of different things and it changes from year to year exactly what those things are. Sometimes it's um, what's going on in the economy might push prices down or what's going on might push them up a little bit. Um, and also the demand for the title on the road after we've talked to our presenters and sometimes the demand is readily apparent from how well the show is already doing on Broadway. Um, after the price and the overall deal for the show is established, then we go out to each of our markets that do full week titles, those are the ones that I work on, um, to gauge their interest and see if we can put together and marry the interest of the markets and the cities across America with the availability of the dates on the tour. And then there's a particular magic that my boss, Meredith Blair, has where she is able to route them one next to the other in week-long engagements where they travel they play a market from Tuesday to Sunday and then travel on the Monday to the next market. Um, one of the things that we have to be very cognizant of is that shows generally cannot travel beyond 750 miles from one market to another. So all of the markets have to be in some close proximity um, geographically to go from one place to another or else we have to do special performance schedules in markets. And people don't tend to like that. So <laughs> the rooting is particularly important um, and uh, is, takes a very special talent and skill in my opinion. Uh, so 
that's something that we work on. And then we kind of get into the overall deal negotiation, the setting of ticket prices, advertising. Um, we share a technical rider, which gives the presenter an idea of what the local labor will be in the market. And then as time goes on, we come to a contract and work with the advertising agency to make sure the advertising plan meets both the producer's expectation as well as the presenter's. And then when we get in market, especially these days or close to it, we work on demand or dynamic pricing together, which could be the raising or the lowering of ticket prices depending on the market's demand for that particular title. So in a very kind of five second soundbite clip, that is the function of a booking agency. Um, in my view, a booking agency is really kind of the center or um, meeting point for the producer, the general manager, the marketing team, as well as the presenter and all of the people who work for the presenter on the road. That is the central place kind of where all of those people meet up and we are responsible for disseminating information to all of those parties. Can you talk about the general manager and what that general manager's responsibility is? Sure. Um, many times after we've secured a title, for the most part, we will deal with a general manager directly on a title. Um, and the general manager oversees all of the financial obligations for the show. They approve all of the um, schedules that I talked about and the the um, mileage jumps from one city to another. So in a way, they are another very big connecting piece because after a certain point, we deal more directly with the general manager and they go back to the producer as needed for approval on um, special terms or things like that. And they are also the, the um, the connector who runs interference for us with their tech team um, to see if we can fit into certain venues, what accommodations may need to be made, and if we can make different jumps because they also deal directly with the trucking company. Kara, can you also talk about there are other people who will interact with a presenter, for instance, the press agent, and can you talk about that role? Yes, um, so the press agent, usually hand in hand with the marketing company, will do a series of advance calls and sometimes even advance trips on behalf of the producer and the production to various markets. Sometimes um, they're able to even bring cast members to do advance press for a particular engagement. If, but the market, sometimes a press agent or a marketing um, person will go and give you a list of all of the available opportunities for a show. Sometimes it even includes educational opportunities or master classes or things like that. And then the presenter comes back and is responsible for saying what he or she thinks will work best in that marketplace for their particular audience and works best with their mission for um, their venue. What would be the five? <coughs> excuse me. What would be the five things that you would expect from a presenter in your relationship? I would expect always that they would book um, that they would book for their market based on product, meaning the quality of the show that's available to them. Um, and thankfully, I feel like we represent a lot of high quality product, and I really feel like the presenters appreciate that and book on that basis. Um, I would expect that they also book based on title. After they've done a certain amount of research with their marketing teams, it's really important to know that your marketing team has a vision and says they're going to be able to sell the title that you're bringing to, you know, for them to sell. Um, financially, it also has to make sense for your market, so I know that Sometimes people book based on a deal that's appropriate for them. When you're setting up your season, usually, usually many times, um, you might have a blockbuster show, two kind of mid-range musicals, a lower level, less expensive musical, or a play to balance out your overall subscription season so that when you're putting a price in front of a, a potential subscriber, it's not completely through the roof because if you had all blockbusters, the price would be um, you'd price yourself out of your own market no matter how great those shows were. Um, I also would probably think of, does it fit with your overall mission of what you're trying to accomplish in your venue? 
is one of the things that you're looking for to bring in new audiences? Um, is diversity part of your mission? Are you looking for an educational aspect to what you present? Are you looking to have a long-term relationship with your audience? And if so, is the product that you're bringing in, is it helping you create that kind of relationship with your patrons? We will come back. As, as you are sitting there, please, um, if you have questions, we're, all three of us will engage in questions when we are finished with our presentation. Can you also, Kara, talk with us about the relationship with Roundabout? Because that's a little bit different. Sure. So we're really fortunate because um, our agency represents tours that the Roundabout Theater produces. And they're a very special producer for us because they are a nonprofit theater and they have their own subscription season here in New York City. So a lot of the things that I hear uh, that issues that some of my presenters are dealing with, the roundabout deals with them here in New York just differently for their own audience. Um, so they are terrific producers for the road. An education program is apparent in all of their shows that they do because that's part of their mission here. So when we send a roundabout show on the road, there is an educational component absolutely built in and it's ready to go in the first market because they've already done it for their subscribers and their patrons here in New York City. Um, the other thing is the roundabout is part of their mission. They want to expand their brand. so. Hopefully one day, if a subscriber in your market sees a show that has roundabout above the title, I'm, we're all hoping that they'll think, oh, the roundabout, I know them. This is going to be good. This is of quality. Um, so that's important to them because hopefully those people will come here to New York City also and buy a ticket to one of their shows here. Um, they're great folks there, and it really means a lot for them to be able to share their shows and their product with your theaters across the country because they feel like brothers and sister theaters with you because they're in it as well. Great. And before uh, we go on to Kendra, would you just um, go over your roster with us so we have an idea of the, the breadth and scope? And look, I happen to have it on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you a little bit. Um, similar to the way that you may book your own seasons where you try to have a variety of shows that are out there we try to represent a variety of shows so that we have something for all of our markets that may appeal to them um, the current tours that we're working on are the roundabouts cabaret which will go out next season we're working on rogers and hammerstein's cinderella which appeals to a family audience and is doing very well on the road right now um, we're also working on motown the musical which is in philadelphia this week and uh, we can't keep people out the doors which is great um, we're next year we'll do the bridges of madison county tour which is opening in des moines iowa where they have the actual bridges of madison county <laughs> um, and the beautiful jason robert brown store score so we couldn't be prouder of that uh, we're working on pippin which is just amazing and i don't know if you saw the piece on cbs sunday morning last week right. but um, lucy arnez is in it right now she's, she's just killing fabulous. it every night we could not be more more proud. Um, our tour of White Christmas just wrapped up this past season. season. It's Irving Berlin show. Um, we did some amazing business. Our friends in Cleveland, they just blew it out the doors. Couldn't find a seat. It was a sold out engagement, a really truly sold out engagement where there are no seats left and you don't hear that very often. Um, we booked two tours of the Book of Mormon. We booked Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and also Andrew Lloyd Webber's Wizard of Oz. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Kendra, one of the things that really makes Broadway ingrained in our community is how you work with a company in terms of educational services. Could you take us through that, please? Yeah. I'm going to go step, step up to oh, my microphone. Great. Um, I'm going to talk about um, We've been really fortunate to uh, to have great relationships with uh, Kara's company and many of the other uh, Broadway agents um, for the shows that we book, and it's been a great relationship, not only on the community engagement programs that I'm going to talk to you about today, but also uh, pretty much every Broadway show that comes through our market has done some sort of education element 
uh, primarily in support of a program that we do is like a Tony Awards program for high schools, our uh, Nebraska High School Theater Awards project. So we've been really fortunate, and uh, one of the things we were talking about before this session started was there's sometimes a, a misconception, I think, with presenters that Broadway shows are not gonna be as receptive to working uh, with you for education and community engagement projects or programs, and that's absolutely a myth. Uh, we've had great success and a lot of flexibility from the show. So I'm just gonna talk through um, a few of the success stories that we've had, and also some of the benefits, as you can see here, for uh, the presenter and for the show. Um, the, the first one is, it really is a great opportunity for, for the presenter to develop new uh, and diverse community members as patrons and also as community partners. Uh, the two projects that I'm gonna to talk to you about did a great job with that, introduced us to uh, relationships that we absolutely did not have before. Um, and it was truly due to the show's um, commitment to the project. Um, education engagement, or community engagement and education tool, as I said, all of our uh, shows uh, contribute some sort of educational or community engagement element. Some contribute more than one. Um, and some have been on a, a pretty large scale. Promotion vehicle, uh, all of these projects have also helped us to develop new audience members. So a lot of times when a participant is working with us on a community engagement supplemental program for a, a show, they're talking the show up. It's a natural promotion tool for them to talk the show up to, to their constituents, many of whom are often not current uh, Broadway attendees. <coughs> And the best thing that all of our, our press reps love to hear is it's free and compelling publicity. Um, the two projects I'm gonna to talk to you about, they, in one case, um, it was a third time the show was in the market. So the, the education and community engagement component was a real shot in the arm from a publicity standpoint for our uh, media partners to have another reason to, to visit with us about the show. So two, two big projects I want to uh, discuss with you. Memphis, which uh, the, the uh, booking group uh, was uh, representing at one point and um, still representing. Yeah. Still. Yeah, and uh, this was a great partnership uh, that we developed in conjunction with the show. Uh, we did this in 2013 when we presented the show. Uh, it was a basically a diversity forum that uh, sparked discussion about prejudice, tolerance, and uh, diversity within our community of Omaha and using themes of Memphis uh, to tie that together for our community members. So diversity form happened actually at the Holland Center, which is one of the two venues that Omaha Performing Arts uh, manages. Um, but the show happened at the Orpheum Theater where all of our Broadway productions occur. Uh, format was all of our participants attended uh, the first night performance, the Tuesday night performance of Memphis the Musical. They then participated the next day in an all-day forum. So we had workshops and panel discussions, a lot of great, um, pretty serious conversations about diversity, prejudice in our own community, and how the themes of the show uh, really can connect to our 2013 situation. <coughs> and then the, probably one of the most special components of this, after the participants had seen the show, I think we had 80% of the participants had never been to a Broadway show before this project. Um, the cast came to the end of the day and did a very special hour-long discussion with the participants, and it was, it was really exciting. People were truly starstruck by uh, the, the leads of the show spending time with us uh, on a two-show day, by the way, uh, which was really pretty exciting. Um, we had a pretty uh, strong community partner, Inclusive Communities. They are a local so social justice organization in Omaha that deals with issues of discrimination and tolerance and prejudice in the Omaha community. Um, and they had a great network of people, again, that we don't really have a regular connection to, uh, particularly for a Broadway performance. So they connected us with the Urban League and the Boys and Girls Club, a lot of social service organizations, LBG, LBGT 
uh, support organizations uh, that brought a completely diverse and new group of people to our project. They also provided trained facilitators who could lead these workshops and these difficult discussions. And we forced participants to uh, be in groups with people that they didn't know. So there was a real uh, diverse group in each uh, session. And then the, one of the other strong components was they assisted us with the promotion of the project and of the show. So the show was very helpful to us in getting uh, some deeply discounted tickets for the participants. And honestly, in turn, some of the participants actually came back a second time and brought family members later in the week. That wasn't the norm, but it was definitely a spreading of the word of the show uh, through this project. Our participants were uh, about 200 adults and students. In this first project, we actually um, mixed adults and students. We learned some lessons from this, and you'll see these two pictures here. These are uh, examples of some of the, uh, the diversity workshops and the tolerance training that, that um, slide on the bottom. Uh, and again, completely new and diverse relationships. Uh, and it was really, it was really a great, great project. This was our first kind of real community engagement project that uh, allowed us to engage with the show in a social context outside of just an education. Our next project, uh, which was super successful, was our partnership with Wicked. And whenever I tell this story uh, to, to folks, they're always like, wow, you were able to do this huge project with a, a ginormous show like Wicked. Um, <coughs> it has had some education elements, but not always um, on this scale. And they had started an anti-bullying project in uh, New York, along with the New York show. And we had heard about it, I think it was through the Broadway League uh, uh, conference. They had also seen a presentation that Omaha Performing Arts had done in conjunction with Memphis and were really, really wonderful and open to us in uh, developing this uh, anti-bullying summit uh, on the road. So uh, this project happened in May. It was on the, it wasn't the opening day, opening concert, but I think it was the second, it was in the first week, it was early in the run. Um, the format, again, somewhat similar to Memphis, but we learned some lessons from the Memphis Forum. Participants did workshops in the venue early, so we did a half a day on the day before, the, or the day of the show. Uh, there were two tracks, so we heard from our Memphis participants that they really preferred for the students and the adults to be separated so that they can have a little bit more frank conversation about the issues that relate to, to each uh, constituent. And then um, an incredible keynote um, by a wicked cast member. In our case, we were able to get Fierro, uh, one of the leads in the show, <coughs> to, again on a two-show day, do um, a talk to our students, which was very inspirational. And we also had a non-arts person, a Heisman Trophy winner from Omaha, Eric Crouch, who is a big supporter of anti-bullying initiatives in Omaha, to speak on the same stage with the artists. So the artist and the, and the football player, completely different groups of people talking about the same issues. Really, really great. All the participants saw the show that afternoon, and then once again, we were very fortunate to get uh, an exclusive talk back with the cast. And you can see here in this picture, um, the woman on top, was uh, is Elphaba in the current tour, and she just, I mean, did a really moving talk about her own experiences with bullying. I mean, the kids were just completely uh, taken with, with her discussion. Um, community partner in this case was um, one that many of you have in your communities, Anti-Defamation League. We partnered with our regional office of the Anti-Defamation League. They have, currently have a program <coughs> called No Place for Hate, which is um, a anti-bullying program for schools. So they have a lot of experience with this. Um, they're a local social justice organization, and Wicked was particularly interested in this organization because they have a national reputation. Um, they provided the trained facilitators. They um, also, once again, assisted us with promotion and community, um, to the community and the schools. And they also helped us uh, have access to uh, the Heisman Trophy winner that we would in other cases not have a relationship with. 
participants were uh, nearly 300, 275 is actually a little bit lower than our actual participation. Uh, we had to turn people away. It was, people were so excited to participate in this. Um, student teacher, student leaders, we had teachers, we had student teachers, we had uh, sports coaches, youth group leaders from Boys and Girls Club, uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, basically all walks of life that deal with kids and kid groups uh, who could experience bullying in their organizations. And then um, the amazing thing, 44 different schools over um, the community organizations over 120 miles. So we had people driving two and three hours, leaving at five in the morning to get here for this day and spend That's the great. day with us. It was really, it's very special um, project. So in both of these cases, I think that the, the major reasons why it worked, really the show, the producer, in the case of Memphis, Sue Frost, the producer, actually came to Omaha. I mean, that is some true commitment. Uh, because she really believed in the mission of the show and the themes of the show and being able to to, to preach the word of tolerance and acceptance. I, I will say the producers of Memphis were really yeah. exceptional and, and education for them was important from day one. And um, Sue Frost is one of those people that walks the walk and talks the talk. She was there with that show every step of the way. And while the program in Omaha in particular was exceptional, she did many, many talks throughout the tour because this was important to them, not only to get the show out there, but the mission of the show was just as important to them to, to reach the maximum number of people. Absolutely, and, and it was, we were really truly fortunate to have her come again to Omaha in the middle of January. Uh, it was pretty exciting. And also, in both cases, the press reps, uh, we talked to them a year in advance. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later but um, they were really, uh, it's really important to get to them early and talk about your vision for your idea, what you'd like to do, and then kind of continue to have the conversation over the course of the season, uh, rather than two weeks before the show saying, hey, we'd like to do this thing, it seems really neat. So um, in, in addition, um, my organization, we're very fortunate to have great leadership classes sit up in the front here, and um, really supports uh, internally uh, kind of going outside of the box and really thinking big on these projects. So when, when I go to, to the boss and say, you know, this is something we, we should do, I don't even have to, I mean, she just says yes, and it's pretty great. And I know Colleen's the exact same way um, in, in her organization, often bringing us ideas to the programming and education department. Um, community partner, this is critical. In both of these cases, we had to, I really, with my staff, had to go meet people completely outside of our art circle um, in the social justice and social service uh, circles. And it's made, we have made such great friends. I can't tell you how many um, additional relationships and partnerships. And as we do look at Motown and other shows that are coming down the pike, people are calling me saying, hey, when are we gonna do another one of those things? Um, same with the Anti-Defamation League and Wicked. So uh, th that has really been a great uh, opportunity for us, but it was also critical to the success of the program. Um, and then the subject matter, both in the case of Memphis and Wicked, you know, we were really thoughtful about what are we going to be presenting within the course of a season, and what are the opportunities in these shows? In the case of Memphis, there was such a great opportunity to preach tolerance and acceptance and um, civil rights and connected to what exactly is happening in all of our communities right now. I mean, all of these shows have some sort of connection to your community if you can find it and ponder it and really uh, build an interesting concept out of it. And if, in the case of Wicked, this last point, a uh, unique way to approach the show, uh, show story and introduce people to um, the show for the first time. In the case of Wicked, we had Wicked, this was our third time. And I think one of the reasons uh, the show was so helpful for us is, it, as I told you earlier, it gave us an opportunity to uh, go to the media with a new twist on the Wicked story. So yes, you've seen the Wicked story again, but here we are relating it to a social issue that's happening very relevant in our communities uh, today. And we got a lot of great press out of uh, both of those projects, but particularly the, the Wicked um, project. Um, and not, none of these things could happen without our donors and corporate sponsorship, and to a certain extent, show sponsorship. They were very 
um, generous with um, tickets and with the uh, help of giving us discounts for our participants, which in turn, I think, also helped promote the show. Uh, a couple things that were issues planning in advance. As I mentioned, we talk to the press agents a year out. So as we're looking at confirming shows now, we'll announce our season in March. Pretty much week after that, we start scheduling our meetings with press agents uh, who are representing the shows and talking about some of the ideas we want to do. Um, and the Broadway League Conference is also a great opportunity for us to do that. They have a day where the education folks and the press reps are in the same room for a whole day, and it makes it a lot easier for us to communicate. Um, funding uh, is definitely a, an issue, and none of these projects could have happened without uh, external uh, funding sources, which were actually fairly easy to come by because of the, the content, um, support from our community partners. Uh, and then finally, what's next in 2015? We're looking to do a project for once, a songwriting program, which I think uh, ASU did. also did a great songwriting commissioning we program. Gonna once again steal it. Stealing's good. Uh, Stealing's good. <laughs> one of their their projects. So um, we're looking to do that this season. And just a couple little things for those of you who are booking Broadway. Um, as I said, get to know the show press reps. They're super helpful. Uh, they often um, give you ideas. If you don't have ideas to start, if you even just make that initial conversation, now our education manager actually has the conversations directly with our press reps in conjunction with our PR manager. So she has a relationship with them. Um, plan ahead, crucial, critical. Uh, develop new partners. Again, as we've said numerous times, the community partners are key. And think big. You know, when we initially thought of this Memphis project, again, there's always this, oh, uh, the show's never going to agree to that. The show's never going to agree to that. If you get everything organized in advance and you really talk through your vision and um, the benefits to both you as a presenter and also the show, um, pretty much anything is possible. I mean, I, I think the shows have been incredibly supportive. Um, so I know we'll take questions a little later. Colleen, I'm gonna give it back to you. Great. She has uh, some great programs that she's been doing. Again, I think some of which Omaha Performing Arts is trying to copy. <laughs> yes, I, and I think <laughs> that's, they're really great. that's why people so, are here to, right, to copy so those. So I turn it back to you and I'll put Thank the, you. your video up. Thank you. At ASU Gamage, we have a 3,000 seat house. So that's a pretty large house. We do roughly seven one week titles in our Broadway season and what we call specials. Three specials which are uh, larger shows like Phantom, The Wickets, and The Les Mises, which may run anywhere from three weeks to nine weeks, depending on it. We have worked very closely with our community on the work that we have. We carefully curate that work. It isn't just you put the season together and say, oh great, they'll come. We think about, in terms of our mission connecting communities, how will each of these shows connect to our communities? There's a series of three questions we ask any company we're going to work with, and, and we're fortunate enough, I'm a Tony voter, I have the opportunity to meet with a lot of the creative teams as they are working on projects, and we ask, what do you want? What do I want? And what do we want together? And it seems like really simple questions, but it's really good to know everything that the company wants, everything they want out of this. And it isn't just as Kara and as um, Kendra have both said, it's not just about finances. It's really about leaving the legacy of Broadway in the community. There are only four art forms that are American art forms. There are only four. Rock and roll, modern dance, jazz and blues, and musical theater. So it's one of our true American legacies. So every company that comes in, every actor that comes in into our community is very much interested in leaving that afterburn. So what do you want? What do I want? And then we work on what we want together. The other thing that uh, we have somewhere between 12 and 14,000 subscribers. And as Kara said, we do demand pricing like everyone else. And sometimes it's higher and sometimes it's lower. We actually reached a high once of 18,000 subscribers and we found out we didn't want that, as crazy as that may sound, because what it didn't leave us for was any room to introduce new people into the work. And when you live in Arizona, two people move in to the state, one person moves out. 
So you're constantly re-educating a community. And while we're also located on a college campus at ASU Gamage, we receive no financial support for the work that we do. So it's a $19 million organization, and we rely on our own financing. You know, if, if we don't do our jobs, people don't get to pay their mortgage and send their kids to college. So it's a critical thing. One of the things that's very exciting about our program, over the past six years, we have contributed over $350 million into our community's economic um, impact. So that includes, we had a national study done through the Broadway League, and that includes not the tickets, but it includes, I came to town, I ate in a restaurant, I bought gas, I spent the night in a hotel, we paid the babysitter, I bought a new dress. And so those kinds of things also make business leaders in your community want to support this work. In fact, one of the things each of our governors, we've been through several, some managed not to go to jail. So that was like a good thing. Okay, that's joke. <laughs> no, I wish it was, but it wasn't. But, what, but each one of our governors has said one of the most important programs in our state in both bringing people in and in terms of our, the communities we represent is our Broadway series. So it's very important. Now, one of the things we think is important is what's left when the show leaves. So we also look at the demographics our, and our changing demographics in our country, and we want to know that we're making an impact, not just for today, but for the future. So the first program I'm going to talk about is the At Pam League Diversity Initiative. I actually, we're not gonna play it yet, but, uh, but um, I actually sit on the board of directors of the Broadway League, and I'm on the executive committee, and this is one of the efforts that, my, that myself and a number of other people are forwarding, because uh, how many of you have diversity in your backstage on your crews? Don't be shy. Good. How many of you have diversity in your front office and your administrative team? Okay, not enough hands. So one of the things we know is if Broadway's going to live and survive, if theater's gonna live and survive in this country with highly changing demographics in this country, we need to have individuals who are reflective of the, of the communities that we live in and we serve. The ADPAM, which stands for the, the um, oh, I always have to look at it. The Association of Theatrical, thank you, who's going to help me, press agents and managers at PAM. Who was helping me out there? Eric. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I can't see that far. Um, and it's a union, and it's a guild. And it's a guild where people learn the craft of both being a press agent and being a theater manager, a company manager. We have created a program through the Broadway League where we take young people who are interested, primarily college students, who are interested in learning the business of our business. How many of you have people who come to your offices and say, I wanna know how you do what you do? I wanna have that job. Everybody's hands should go up. Because a day doesn't go by where a student doesn't walk in going, how do I get this job? How do I learn how to do this? Well, this program is designed for all of the companies that tour across the country to take on an intern. And an intern who comes in with the case of our intern, um, Jeremy Gillette, who you will just see, he not only spent time with the company, he spent time with all of us ahead of time to know and understand each of the roles in the theater, whether it's the box office, the marketing office, the technical staff, the programming staff, to learn those roles. And so when a company comes into town, they take this individual underneath their wing and teach them the rigors of being a company manager. So I'm going to have you hit that. To get a show on the road, keep a show on the road, and have a successful. Yeah, let's start at the beginning. But change don't come easy. My position is I'm an intern, um, the first national intern for the Broadway League and ATPAM. And ATPAM stands for the Association of Theatrical Press Agents and Managers. And so what I'm doing here is I, I'm learning the business end of what it takes to get a show on the road, keep a show on the road, and have a successful show. We are so excited about the ATPAM League Diversity Initiative. First and foremost, this is a brainchild that came out of a gathering of every union in New York City. We're starting this week here at Arizona State University as the, uh, for this test pilot um, because uh, Colleen Jennings Rogensock uh, is spearheading this program and uh, with, uh, with the Broadway League 
and APAM. And so we're very happy to be here and call this our, our first stop on this initiative. Well, we are backstage at Memphis. Oftentimes, actors don't get to ch get the chance to work with someone very savvy in the business. And that someone, in my regard, is Eric. When I'm with Eric, it's almost as if it's, it's the regular day for him. But it's a lot of information that he's giving me. And it's a lot of useful and valuable information as I move forward in my career. Jeremy's fire is already, already very high, highly ignited in terms of the world of theater and of Broadway. Eric is giving Jeremy an inside look of what it takes to keep the road going, to keep the road functioning. Okay. We want to reach out to the African American population, the Hispanic population, the Asian population, the Middle Eastern population. Uh, America's growing diversity and we want to be able to reflect that within our own um, uh, memberships. You know, you need people who understand the business so these people can display their talents. Here we're doing this on this wonderful, great, wonderful tour of Memphis. It's the story of how um, the, um, the, the music of Black Beale Street got onto the white airwaves um, because of a radio DJ who uh, fell in love with music and at the same time fell in love with the girl. It's um, not only a story about the music, but it's also a love story and an interracial love story. You stand on the shoulders of those who come before you. These shoulders are here so Jeremy can stand on my shoulders, so the next generation can stand on his shoulders, and so forth and so on. Nobody gets here by themselves. Oftentimes, people say we believe in you, but they don't invest in you. And, and, and they have invested in you. Ten and a half. We'll find Whether he ever goes in this direction or not, ultimately he gets to see the whole picture of the theater business, and this is just one more aspect of that picture. Uh, I'm just thankful for everybody who made this thing happen. We're about challenges, and Arizona State University solving those challenges, solutions, and this is one of them. So what's wonderful about this program, we now have five interns this year, and in fact one of them is our at PAM Diversity Interns, one of them is with us here at the conference as an Arts Presenters intern, Erica Moore, is that a student can come in, they work around, the company works around a student's schedule, and they have this incredible experience. Jeremy's actually graduated, he's actually working on the West Coast, he's actually working in the theater business, which is really, truly exciting for that to happen, and then that word spreads out to their friends. For those of you who aren't on university campuses, Probably in every community in this room, there's a college, a university, or community college where you can access those students. And what we have found from the faculty members is they are thrilled. In fact, I, I have um, the head of the theater department said, I wish you could take 12 students every, you know, with every, every year and, and be able to do this. So it's a wonderful way to engage the students, engage the community. Also, this, this um, piece of video footage was shot by a news crew which wound up putting it on television and, and again telling our story for ourselves. As both Kara and Kendra has said, Sue Frost is fabulous. So working with her and being able to do that work was really easy. She really wanted to do it. What we have found through the Broadway League is all producers want to be able to do this. It isn't that we get pushback, it's that how do you do this? We had um, a meeting here, uh, Waka, the Women of Color in the Arts, and there's a young woman, Lindsay Roberts, who was out with the Porgy and Bess performance, and she, while she was with us, we have a program called Kaleidoscope, and we take 10 teachers, 10 students, 10 schools, and we bring them to a Broadway show. They get curriculum ahead of time so the teachers can teach, and then it always happens on a turnaround day, which is amazing that the actors will do this, but between a matinee and an evening performance, they come and they see the show, and then they have a early supper with the cast. And, and I don't mean pizza and styrofoam cups. I mean china, silver, hot food. The cast is thrilled because it's obviously <laughs> they're like, wow, a good meal with hot food. And the kids, and this is what's interesting about this particular program, Kaleidoscope, these are not your A and B students. These specifically, when I met with the superintendents of the schools, and our program is, I think, going into its 18th year now, I said, I want those kids who can't figure out how to come to school two weeks in a row. I want the kid who had a D and made it a C. I want those kids who can't figure out where they want to go in life. And then when we sit down and we have the meal in between, we serve it on our promenade, is the actors talk about education. 
they talk about their education and how they got their education. And I will tell you to a person, most, most of those actors are happy to do it, thrilled to do it, and want to know why it isn't happening in every Broadway house on the road. So for those of you who are thinking about those things. In addition, we have a school to work program, and it's a program that teaches the business of our business. And we work with a Broadway show, and then we have three high schools, and they have to be committed to us for a semester. And all of my staff then become the faculty of that program. So they spend time with, and it's, a day, it's just a day program, but they spend time with the tech people, the marketing people, the development people, the operations people, and they learn how to select a show, get the show in the house, and how to market the show. And, they, and that's their assignment throughout the day. And they spend the day doing that, and then that evening, they come back to the show, and they come onto the stage, and they spend time with the cast. So it's another one of those programs. High visibility for television, we have more schools than we have the ability to fill to have this program happen. So Kaleidoscope is another one of those programs. I'm now going to ask you to play this, sure. this video um, in just one second. We have a program that's called Family First Nights, Military Family First Nights. And this is probably one of my most heartfelt programs. It's very near and dear to my heart. You will see in this video. It is a program that is supported by the Arizona Lottery. The, we are the only arts organization that the lottery has made a multi-year commitment to, financial commitment to, and uh, let's just hit it and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. Thank you. Well, my husband was deployed in October of 2009 with the Arizona National Guard. I'm not sure how long my dad's been in the National Guard, but I've heard my mom say he's been in it for 19 years. When he first left, the hardest thing was just trying to figure out a new routine. It's emotionally draining. You just really just focus on the day-to-day -day tasks. And when you do have free time, you kind of just want to sit and be by yourself. Well, my life was pretty good before he left, but then, like, after he left, everything just felt like it sank. I hated when my dad was deployed and really have a fun experience here. And just didn't really like life at the time. When you're a military family, there isn't a lot of extra, and I, I think a lot of people don't realize this, that uh, many of our uh, men and women who are working in the armed forces sometimes take on second jobs too, just to keep their families going. So things like the arts really are extra here at ASU Gamage. The program that we are most proud of is our Military Family First Nights program. It enables us to bring 100 to 200 military dependents to three Broadway shows. And he was over in Iraq when I found out about the Family First program. And I was really excited because I really like going to plays and haven't had the opportunity to take my kids. And so my husband's home from his deployment and I just thought this was a good opportunity for us. I was pretty excited because I haven't seen like a Broadway show or anything. I went to Game of Auditorium. I saw White Christmas and it was pretty cool. Well, Kaylin's excited. She's, um, you know, she dances, so it was really, it's really neat for her to get to go and see people perform on another level than she's used to. The other thing that's really wonderful about this is every cast, every Broadway cast we have worked with, consider it an honor to meet with his military families because this is our way of saying thank you. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for making the sacrifice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we can never say thank you enough. I also felt great. I didn't even know we were going to meet the actors at the end of the play. So I guess that was kind of a surprise for me. And uh, they were actually a really nice cast and they were really fun to talk to. I kind of felt special. The Arizona Lottery it is such a great organization. What it really does is all of those funds that come back in go back out into our communities and support our arts groups, our education groups, our families, and because of those funds, the Arizona Lottery enables 200 military dependents to come to the theater three times a year. That's pretty extraordinary. And it, it is such a great program, and it is the kind of program that businesses in your community go attach our name to that. Also, 
those military families at this past year, and I, I want to say both with Memphis and White Christmas, those are companies that CARA are from CARA's office and organization. And so you, you'll see a running theme that the booking group helps us a great deal in making these things happen. This past year, last year we did Wizard of Oz, and we have a program in the Military First Night, and it's called There's No Place Like Home. And Senator McCain and uh, Mrs. Cindy McCain and I hosted 300 military families because there's no place like, both Cindy McCain and I are both military brats. So it was like really a perfect um, hosting of them. And, and every one of those military families went, thank you so much for doing this for us. And we're like, we can't do enough for you. And it was such an amazing night for, again, 300 families to come. And businesses in our community paid for those tickets, which was just great. In addition, we have another program that's called Heroes Night. And on Heroes Night, we honor heroes in the military. We worked with the Broadway show War Horse. And that night, we honored um, military, active duty military who work with service animals. And we had um, all of those individuals. We had the dog that found bin Laden. I mean, he was like the star of the evening. And <laughs> no, it was great. And, and we were able to bring them up on stage, thank them. We worked with our local ROTC to present the colors. And we had our um, Army um, uh, band play the Star Spangled Banner before the show. And I had audience members come up afterwards and say they have never been so moved. And they actually thought patriotism was dead till they came to Gamage. And so our Heroes Night program, this year we will be doing Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, another one of Kara's shows. And we will be talking about going through arduous times together along with the theme of Joseph. But this year we're doing two Hero Nights programs. And the second night will be Motown, another one of Kara's programs. And we will be, I know, it's usually a running theme here. And we will uh, make it military date night. So active duty military can come, the husband and wife can come out for a date night and we always do dinner and we always do that opportunity for them to get together. We have another ongoing program which is a vet text program and I think in many of your communities you must have veterans programs where they reach out and you're able to provide them with tickets and be able to build a relationship there. Uh, okay, we're almost ready for this. Every Thursday night of any run, and if we're doing a nine-week run of Phantom or we're doing a one-week run of Joseph, is Talk Back Thursday. And myself, if I'm in town, and a local radio personality have the cast come out, and they do a talk back with the audience. And you would think after a long day of work, and then people come, our season runs from, our weekly program runs Tuesday through Sunday with two shows on the matinees on the weekends. Afterwards, people stay for Talk Back we had in the Heights, and we had over a thousand people stay for talk back to just hear what the artist had to say. And in that particular um, week run, Lynn manuel Miranda, who won the Tony for the show and the creator of the show, actually conducted the talk back. And then what we find is there's additional advertising and promotion you get by having a local radio person or television person be your co-host in doing this. And again, the cast are overwhelmingly happy to do it. We also have a program with the Girl Scouts where they can earn their theater badge by coming and sometimes they actually learn how to do the front of the house work, taking tickets and those kinds of things. And then they come too and we have a scout night with the companies. And here's, here's a secret. Here's a secret. On Tuesday night, every night we open a show, we throw a party. And it's a dinner party for the cast. Now you're probably thinking, oh my god, that must cost a lot of money. We have a relationship with every restaurant in our downtown area. And they fight over these opening night parties. The cast comes, they do food, we take the liquor bill, albeit the short end of the stick. But the cast comes and has a great time. And they, and they say, we, go all, we travel all over and nobody does this for us. But we do it, so we say thank you, welcome to our community. We have our donors come, so we do some photo op opportunities. And Lucy Arnaz was fabulous. She was, after, and John Roth, fabulous with um, Pippin. And it gives them a sense that they're welcomed into a community. It gives them a sense that you really want them there. They get to see your faces and your staff's faces. So I highly recommend going to the restaurants. And the restaurant association was so thrilled. And as more restaurants open up, they go, OK, when is our night to have cast night? Also, when cast members are in town, where do they go back to dinner? 
where they had cast night, which is great. Um, one of the other things I just want to talk about briefly, and then we're going to open it up for questions, is there are other opportunities in the programs that you do to work with cast members before they actually come to town. Kara mentioned briefly uh, public announce programs. And we do two season public announces, one in the spring, and then we do uh, one in the summer. And the spring is for our subscribers only. And we bring in cast members from the cast that are going to be coming, and they do short songs and dances. We have a local co a company provide food, and then everyone gets to ask questions. And they get to have a Q&A, and I show a, a long film. In the summer, we do the same thing, but then we recognize a rising star of Broadway. And this will be our, just our third year, fourth year, of recognizing an Arizonan who's come to New York and made it big or is on a tour. And it's just a fantastic way of recognizing your own community and, and also a way of doing other public things. One of the special things we're going to do with Motown is we, are, we have a huge uh, recognition ceremony of Dr. King's birthday. And there's a breakfast, and there are about 500 people who come to the breakfast, and there are kindergartners through 12-year-olds who talk about what it means to be a servant leader. It's all the local leaders, and I will tell you, legislators love this stuff. For our Hero Nights program, both the mayor and the governor do proclamations, and they love to talk. And so two members of the Motown cast, company, the cast will come and perform three songs in the process of our MLK celebration. And everyone is so excited, and there's already a lot of press just about that. So what we'd like to do now is open it up. We have about 30 minutes to do Q&A and discussions. And I will also ask if there are any things that either of you have not said yet that has come to mind and you'd like to say. I was just going to say, as I said earlier, uh, in Omaha, we mimic a lot of what uh, our other colleagues are doing in the, in the uh, Broadway world. So uh, we actually spoke with Colleen's staff about instituting a Heroes Night in Omaha. We just did our first one this year, wildly successful. We're going to do uh, make this an annual event. Uh, one of the shows that they did in the past that I can't talk about right now that might be represented by somebody at this table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, we will be doing a, a Heroes Night with that show as well and um, mimicking a lot of the things that you've already done. The At Pam Diversity Initiative, uh, Colleen uh, introduced Omaha to that program, which we started to do. And um, we've been fortunate to help other organizations that are also looking to do things we do. So um, I think one of the takeaways is uh, definitely connect with your colleagues about what they're doing, even just hopping on their website to see. I mean, a lot of these things are on your website, and um, a lot of times my staff will just kind of troll a lot of the other um, Broadway presenters' websites to see what kind of education and community engagement work is already happening. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great stuff out there that's already, that's already going on. So. The only thing that I would add is that all of these programs are phenomenal, and they all came from a germ of an idea um, that somebody at the venues had, and then that idea had to be communicated through the booking agent and through the marketing team, um, and to be approved by the general managers and the producers. So. The only thing I have to say is please ask and try to communicate your idea as clearly as possible because there's a certain part where it's a little bit like a game of telephone where the booking agent is then responsible for communicating exactly what you want to do to the other person and you want to make sure the person on the other side hears clearly and concisely what you're trying to do. And I would say nine times out of ten, we are so fortunate. We work with so many great people, the response is usually yes, and, and they wind up adding on to the idea to really make it something that's special for both your audience and for the show itself. Great. All right, we'd open it for questions, and we have two microphones here. Don't be shy. Yes, please. Good. Uh, Mike Richmond from the AT&T Center, hey, Meredith, uh, from AT&T Performing Arts Center in Dallas. We are in the process of investigating in partnership with the local Girl Scouts organization, uh, some STEM and STEAM oriented programs. Um, and uh, it's such a hot topic and you know, th th this whole tradition so they can actually earn badges with real content attached. I'm curious if you guys have ever explored anything of that nature, um, anybody in the room that may have, because we're starting from scratch. 
Um, I know that a number of the shows have patches. I know Wicked was a big one for us, um, and there's other shows that do have patches. Uh, and I, I think, can you also ask a show if they will create a patch? Because um, we also have a pretty strong relationship with Girl Scouts, um, and that's another opportunity. The shows are really great. They understand that relationship with Girl Scouts and are usually willing to offer some sort of talk back or uh, added value aspect um, in addition to the group sale uh, that really makes it worth their while. So if the show doesn't have a patch, I would ask if they could yeah, absolutely. make one. And, and we've had that same experience where we have gone to a show and said, you know, can we have a patch? Can we utilize the image that you have in that situation? And I've never been told no. And then I, I don't know the, to the extent of your program with the yeah, Scouts. So this was an education for me. So a patch you get just for attending. The badge is the thing that you do where there's right. an activity and an education element to it. And we're trying to create some deeper dive type programming around that experience of coming to the show. And then there's an activity. And uh, we just haven't, we're, we're in the process of formulating it now. And there doesn't seem to be any, be any history in the industry of that. So Well, and I know one of the things that our cultural participations uh, department does, and uh, Melissa Vulicek is our cultural participations manager, is she works with the scouting communities again provides curriculum for them and often someone from the staff will go and meet with the company about the program about the history of the program we had a great time and i see meredith blair in the audience so she'll think this is very funny but we have a, a program that's that we bring in camp broadway and it's a new york based program and we bring it in every year and the first time camp broadway ever came and it's a week long Broadway audition experiences for campers, for their, our campers are ages 10 to 18. So when we have our Camp Broadway week, we always try to do something that's like Newsies or like a, you know, a good Disney show or something that's really fun. And so um, <laughs> Meredith and Kara came and said, you know, we got this routing and we really need to do Porgy and Bess then. And I was like, Porgy and Bess during Camp Broadway? Oh my God, the parents are gonna kill me. And I loved it, let me tell you, first of all, A, we did it. B, it was wonderful. C, it gave us the opportunity to talk to all of the parents ahead of time about that. Because there is a scene, how many of you saw Porgy and Bess on the road or in Broadway, which was fabulous. But there's this moment of it, you know, with Crown, and it, it looks like it was like a rape scene, right? And I said, you know, on Wednesday night, could we just like tone it down a bit? But what we were able to do was to meet with all of our parents and talk about the history of Broadway, of musical theater, and that Porgy and Bess was the first musical to integrate theaters in this country. That Porgy and Best actually was the first musical to tour internationally. And that there was a historic importance. And actually when the um, company manager came, he, both he and I did that, did that talk together with the parents. But we gave the parents the option of saying, if you think it's going to be like too tough, you can opt out of it. And a couple of parents did. But most of the others went, oh, it was great. And we went, when we do Camp Broadway, the students and the campers get a ticket, but parents are able to buy a ticket. So often you have a student who comes on Wednesday night and then the campers come on Wednesday night. Also, just a little bit about Camp Broadway, we try to commit a third to half of our 94, 96 students as full ride scholarship students. So it's another program that we raise monies for, but we're able to broaden the scope of our students who come. And I'll just do this little story and yeah, we still have time. We were having our scholarship dinner and so students have to do a writing exercise and then we evaluate their blind uh, evaluate their writing and then we choose the scholarship students they come and they have a special dinner they get a tour of the theater and I was sitting with a table and this this young woman and she was like young she was like 12 okay this little girl she leans over and she said my grandfather built Gamage and I said what your grandfather built Gamage so I went over and I, I talked to her grandparents who were her legal guardians and I said did you build Gamage? He said, yes, I was on the construction crew and I'd never been in Gamage. So I said, why don't you come with me and you and your wife and let's you know, take your granddaughter and I put her up on stage. I had my crew put all the lights on because we do our dinner in the lobby on the stage and I said, sing something and she sang God Bless America and we sobbed. We sobbed. But here you think about someone, this building would not have been here for this individual, and they'd never been in the building. And so one of the great things about all of these programs, it's a way of welcoming all facets of your community into your building. 
Another question. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but every one of your references was to a musical. Yes. Except War Horse, which I think is not a musical. No, it's not. Uh, how do any one of the three of you deal with issues of a play in relationship not only to these programs, because I imagine the possibilities are very similar, but in planning your season, finding a play, believing a play can be sold, as opposed okay, to I'll, I'll take just okay, music. Okay, I want to say you said the P word. <laughs> and I have in my vision, I am committed to always having a play on the season. Always, always, always. It sometimes is not successful. We've even been known to book a play on the season and then the tour falls apart and we don't have a play. I think it's critical. And when you, you know, 20 new shows are gonna open on Broadway this spring. They're not all going to be musicals. To make sure an audience understands that. And I'll give you an example. When we did 12 Angry Men, we wanted to be able to engage the community and we worked with a series of law firms and so every night we had a discussion led by lawyers with the cast as part of our, our evening's performance. People stayed, people loved it. Richard Thomas, who is like one of the most amazing, famous, wonderful people in the world, I would come backstage and he'd say, hey, I was out having dinner and I met this group and I'm gonna go talk to a class. Hey, I was out in dinner and I met the Rotarians. I'm gonna go have lunch with them on Friday. He is so fabulous and so committed to the play being on the road. And, I, and it's a very hard thing because plays, how many weeks does it take, Kara, for, for a show to go out? As many weeks as it takes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it truly, it, it takes as many weeks as it takes depending on what the play is. If you're talking about a play that has a huge physical production, like August Osage County, that's a different twist than another play that might be one person or two people with no set. But our company is very committed and putting out plays is very important to us. Um, we worked on the tour of 12 Angry Men on August Osage County on proof um, and have done so over the years and, and it has to be the right play for the right title and the right title that people are responding to to be able to sell it. Um, yeah. And I would say from an education standpoint, um, I think the plays sometimes work even harder to prep education materials. And I know when we presented War Horse, they came to our market, um, I wanna say, was it a year out? It was eight months, it was far in advance to really give us a sense of how we could promote the show, what some of the tactics and angles that have been successful in other markets, and just incredibly generous with their time um, for education and community engagement work. They did um, one of our most popular uh, high, Nebraska High School Musical Theater Awards workshops was the acting workshop that the cast from War Horse led. We actually had to um, turn people away for that because we were at such capacity. And the show was very generous with making sure students were able to see the show on uh, the Wednesday night of the run. So I think in a lot of ways, there are great opportunities from an education standpoint to really maximize the usage of the cast and the themes of the show. Meredith, do you want to say something? Because I know the American play is incredibly important to you. Do you have anything else to Meredith add? Blair, the president of the Booking She's, Group yeah. office. No, I just wish more people felt like you did. I, I wish Truly. people wanted to book them. They're, they're very difficult to book. Most presenters feel that their audiences want musicals. I don't know that they're right, but that's, the pre right. and that's who we sell to. We sell to the presenter. We depend on the presenter to sell to the audience. Um, and getting past that barrier, if you will, right. is, is very difficult. There's a perception that, that, they, that their audiences don't want to see that. And then, the, on the rare exception, when they do bring in a play, there's <laughs> they often get comments from their, why don't you do this more often? It's like, right. And then right. the next cycle comes around, we try and sell a play, and it's usually, tough. The, usually the answer to your question is usually a minimum of 30 weeks. Right. And right. we're always just about, like the past couple of years, we've always been about five short of that. Yeah, right. And I, I would also say, as you're beginning to curate your Broadway seasons, demand a play. Demand a play that you can get behind. And I know when we did Peter and the Starcatcher, we had a house full of young people we had never seen before. I don't know how many of you have seen the play. It's such a great imaginative play. 
and we found young people truly related to the play and we also worked with we have a Lort theater and some Lort B theaters in town and we also worked with them and did workshops with them and it was it was just great but we have Meredith's right we have to make the demand and we have to take the risk and we also have to say Broadway is a wide breadth of things you know for instance Currently, I don't know if Illusionist is still opening, uh, still on Broadway or not, but there was a magician, you know, touring magicians. I mean, there's a wide array of things, and if we are only feeding our people big blockbuster musicals, that's the only thing that they're going to know. Mm -hmm. And I think they really, and sometimes you have to take a couple of little beatings and go, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I didn't like that. I, I won't say the name of the play, but I was in the bathroom and this woman said, I just don't like this, Colleen. It's not a musical. I said, but it won the Tony. She goes, I don't care about the Tony. I, I want my musical. I went, wow, it's one show in nine titles. You know, so good question. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. That, would you like to take that? Would you like to take I that? Think I, can, I can. I can answer it. it. Yeah, I think there's still opportunities if you just talk to the press rep. Really, the press rep is like the conduit to to all things education. <laughs> it's really helpful, um, and I know that there are um, presenters doing something on a split week. I mean, even Saturdays are difficult with the two show days typically, but and Fridays the load in, but it's. It, talk to the press rep and just see what's what the options are again if there's a PR opportunity around it sometimes there's also a better opportunity to get a cast member to do something for a lot of our master classes we invite media to the master classes we get all of our teachers and students to allow us to do that through waivers and whatnot uh, but that is a nice little added bonus for the show too to say well this is a it's an education thing but we're also um, doing it as a media uh, push. And, and oh, go ahead, Kendra. I was just going to say one of the things that Kendra mentioned earlier, which I think is also sound advice for really anyone, is to get ahead of it very early on. And also, if you're a split week market, sometimes the show might be coming from another location that's geographically close to you. So it's not necessarily the case that their jump is huge and they're not going to be there till the last minute or whatever. So get in front of it with the press agent early. There might be time in the schedule to be able to do some kind of active community involvement and just really get ahead of it. That is the best advice. And I will tell you, the press reps also do something else for us. We ask for a sheet and ask where every actor is from, every crew member is from, where the music musical director is from, and we are probably nine times out of ten, someone is from Arizona. And if not from our town, they're from somewhere in Arizona. And then what we do is we contact their relatives who are still there. <laughs> And they say, oh, so-and-so's coming. That would be great. And we, con we contact them. And they go, I would love to. Whatever it is, I would love to do it. And sometimes they'll call us and say, um, I just want to let you know I, I'm going back to my high school to talk to them. And, like we, and we had like no idea. So it's really good to find out where those performers are from. And especially if they're from your hometown, they want, where are you from? There are people from Sioux Falls, yeah. South Dakota. I used to live in Rapid City. And the there are media, people from, yes. The media loves those stories too. So if you have a cast member that's from Sioux Falls that's doing a workshop with your kids, that is an incredible uh, press opportunity. Or well. anywhere in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Like anywhere in South yep. Dakota. That's great. And also, not only that, but to know what colleges they went to, which is really helpful. We had one cast show up, and there were six cast members from Arizona State University. And then the lead, I know it was so odd, and then the lead said, but my brother went here, can I? And we did really special things with them. We highlighted them, we had them do interviews. So the rest of the cast is going, well, well, how about me? How about, like, what are you gonna do with me? So I think that's one way to deal with split weeks in doing that. Other questions? Are, are, are other people doing other things, that, like, things we've not talked about that you'd like to share? I know you are. Yes, Eric. Well, so somebody's putting a hand up. All right, Eric, thank you. After producing for about 40 years, <coughs> off Broadway, on Broadway, regional theater, started the George Street Playhouse in Brooklyn, New Jersey, listening to this, I'm taking the liberty of bringing up um, something that I want to leave as my last legacy to the New York, but you just gave me the idea of maybe the touring theater. And that is starting something that is called the Masterworks 
Theater Company. Huh. Believe it or not, the site was not taken on the internet. <laughs> so we're starting off-Broadway, and the goal, I'm 70, I hope by 75 to be in a Broadway house 30 weeks a year with the great master works that every young person should have a chance to see cool. between ninth grade and age 25. Low ticket prices, always multiracial, multi-ethnic testing. Cool. We begin cool. in a 200-seat off-Broadway theater this May with the Glass Menagerie. Felicia Rashad may be our Amanda. Wow. When I spoke with her, I suggested if she knew someone who wanted to play her daughter in the play, she said, you mean like my daughter? I said, well, what a good idea. We never thought of that. <laughs> and then we're doing Midsummer Night's Dream in June. We may have Leia Galeria as our bottom. Wow. So the reason I bring it up is I'm very interested in young people, education, the road, plays, masterworks. When I was 15, I saw King Lear in Stratford, Connecticut, city empty for its 25th year up in Stratford, Connecticut, and that really changed my life. So if anybody's interested in thinking about or hearing more about, or somehow in a year or two booking or participating in the Masterworks Theater Company, it's great. simple productions, not major sets, hopefully named people who okay. might go out for five weeks or eight weeks, but not 30 weeks. Anyway. That's the vision. That's great. Let's that's, go. Ter that's terrific. It's terrific. I'd like to applaud that. Other questions people might have? Other thoughts? Well, we have about 10 minutes. So we will stay here, and then you can talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. I think this has, I, I want to first of all, absolutely thank Kara, who came in and saved my skin. Thank you for <laughs> being here. Absolutely. And Kendra. And if you have any questions at all, we're in the book. Kara and the booking office is in the book. So feel free to give us a call. Because I think all the, we are, as Diane Paulus, the great director, said, we're all in this together. And whether it's the Masterworks Theater Company that you're starting, Broadway, The Road, we're all in this together. Broadway is indeed the longest road in America. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, yeah, ladies. Yeah. High five. High five.